All right, everyone, we are going to pick up here with chapter 10 around e-commerce, digital markets, and using digital goods or what in the world digital goods are. Um, at this point in the game, 2021, I think all of us have had some interaction with digital markets. And if you've purchased any kind of software uh, or used any kind of online service, perhaps even to, to do your taxes, perhaps a digital service, uh, you've had some interaction with things that we're going to talk about tonight. So I, I truly don't think that this is going to be too foreign to us. To that end, I don't know that tonight's content is going to be is going to take us too late into the evening. And that's when we'll have some time to quickly meet with our groups to make sure that we're on track with the second um, group paper. And then we'll wrap up the evening. So let's just talk quickly about the service Uber. We can replace Uber to a point with Lyft. Uh, if we want to. And we've talked before about disruptive innovation and Clayton Christensen earlier on in the semester um, using digital services to hail a taxi. Um, before the advent of Uber, before they're arriving on the scene, the way you got a taxi is you went down to the corner and you stood there as X number of taxis drove past you. Um, there weren't too many taxi services or ride sharing or ride services that you could use an app. Um, Uber comes along and says, okay, we're going to change this. We're gonna add a digital element to the platform where you can do the hailing electronically or you do the hailing of a taxi digitally. Um, and as we've also talked about before, my second bullet point here, were the regulatory hurdles dealing with catching up to this. We know the laws are never able to catch up to how fast digital transformations can happen. Um, so could we shoehorn in a hailing service in the traditional model that we had before to get a taxi? Didn't seem like that was working. We couldn't just have cars driving around with the full cost of those cars 24 seven and be able to add in the digital element on top of that. The solution ended up being almost a, a timeshare of sorts to, um, to cars that were already on the road, allowing people to share their cars as needed. And then they added in some algorithms for demand prediction. So, you know, when you're trying to get an Uber and there is an event going on in your city, um, the rates seem to go up before that event even happens or before rush hour at any particular time, certain times on the weekend. Um, if you're headed down to the south side, you know, before it starts getting busy down there, the Uber and Lyft fares start going up and people haven't even necessarily started to go down there yet but they know demand is going to start rising and they start raising their rates accordingly. So in this instance, we're using digital services um, to disrupt an existing platform. Are there any others that we've come across where we had more traditional software, more traditional service offerings that we've seen a digital disruptor to? Anything that we've come across in our travels? Certainly something with shopping. Um, I think we can certainly take a look at applying Amazon to this as well. I think we can come across a lots of different shopping services that we disrupted traditional brick and mortar um, for, we'll use Amazon um, as well. Um, and then the, the issues that have come up with regulatory around tax collection, um, it's come up a few times in the software industry when you're selling software across state lines, where do you apply the taxes? Um, to what state do you apply the taxes? Where it was made, the software was built, where it's sold, or do the digital goods have any tax ramifications at all? And that's still something that is a bit of a hurdle um, all the time. Um, it hasn't necessarily been solved. So we talked about e-commerce or the electronic commercial space, uh, e-commerce space really kind of got its start with um, the boom of the internet starting really around 1995 and has grown exponentially. Even in times where we experienced the recession, maybe around 2008, um, e-commerce platforms and service has continued to move forward. Um, everything that survived the dot-com bubble is essentially still working right now. There's new e-commerce mediums, new e-commerce platforms. And here I list social. Why might I list social as an e-commerce platform? 
obviously we get local businesses and their, their online presence. Um, we get that you can also do your shopping on mobile, but where does social fit into that? Facebook has a store, right? You can get Facebook shops. Um, it's interesting outside of our, um, our office a few times a week, there's a food truck that pulls up. And when I order my food through the food truck website, um, it's typically the Facebook store or Facebook sales platform that does the processing for the company. And I always thought that was kind of interesting that they're using the Facebook store as their, as their platform for their, their service. So when we talk about um, social lives right along inside of that e-commerce platform as just another way to process those transactions. And we're moving away from desktop to smartphone. Obviously, um, they're probably much more powerful um, to get into the hands of the users. Not everyone is at a desktop. And if I can buy things from my smartphone, I certainly do more of that. I don't know about you guys, but earlier in the week, I might start an Amazon cart. <laughs> and then as the week goes on, I just keep adding to it random things I need all week long. And I'm on my phone and I might, I, I'm out of getting low, low on deodorant. I might scan that on my phone. And as I go through the week, I just keep adding things to it. Um, and I'm better about having Amazon arrive at my house every single day and have it arrive at my house maybe once a week. But I just start a cart from my smartphone and kind of add to it all day long and interact with amazon.com less and less and less and use the app um, more and more as I go on. Just a graph illustrating the, the growth of um, B2C, and we'll talk about this acronym in a moment. This is business to consumer, uh, but we'll cover some of these in just a moment. From 2001, less than 100 billion to 2020, where we're almost at a trillion dollars. So why is this different? The first word, one of my favorite words on the planet, ubiquity. What does something that's ubiquitous mean? Ubiquity means everywhere. Something that's ubiquitous is everywhere. When we're dealing with something that's brick and mortar, it can't be everywhere by nature, right? It's limited to its defined physical space. But something that's ubiquitous can be everywhere. Um, when it's in your pocket, uh, when it's on something that's mobile, you're taking this market space everywhere you go. How many times have you been in a store, Target, Walmart, and I'm really guilty of doing this in, in books, bookseller stores, picking up a book, looking at how much it costs, and then searching for it on Amazon, flipping it over, scanning the barcode, and then ended up maybe adding it to my cart in Amazon. I don't need it right away. And especially if it's a couple dollars cheaper, I'll just wait for a couple days to get it. Um, we're using the power of that mobile market space to get a lower cost for the actual item. Um, and some of those transaction costs can be reduced as well. They may be something that we can get on sale. Um, there may be something that we can get in bulk that, you know, there's a multi-pack that will get something at a lower cost. And maybe there's a reduced transaction cost to that as well. Um, there's also the transaction costs associated with having to haul ourselves somewhere to go get something. We have to get up, get dressed and go to Wally World. Um, we have to drive somewhere, there's gas or other transportation costs if we don't have a car and perhaps you have to Uber somewhere. Well, boy, isn't it much cheaper when the stuff can just come to you and you didn't have to go anywhere. That's, that's much cheaper for all of us. Those transaction costs don't have to necessarily be monetary, right? There's something else we could be doing. We could be procrastinating a paper for our BUSBIS 1060 class. And instead of going out shopping, we could be doing that. Um, the transaction costs of other assignments or studying, or we could be at work and earning income versus going out shopping for things that we need that can just come to us while we're at work. So transaction costs typically valued monetarily. We can also think about them as opportunity costs doing something else. Of course, e-commerce has the global reach. A brick and mortar is typically just selling to the local market. When we have e-commerce, we can sell anywhere. There are no boundaries to a point. Of course, there are certain countries that will limit sales or, or something along those lines, but to a point we can get anywhere else. Um, there's one set of standards, whatever the standard is on the internet, and that's probably a communication protocol platform set of standards. 
And there is to a point some level of richness. And what does that mean? Well, the internet can allow us to embed some video of the product or somebody using the product, some high quality photos, um, pictures or something of that in use by people out in the wild. Um, you can have some device that you're trying to sell and have rich photographs of people using it in their day-to-day -day lives versus seeing it on a store shelf and having no context how somebody might use that. Um, and some buyers need to see how I might use a product for them to be able to buy it. But when they can get um, graphics or video of somebody actually using it, and then they can see in their mind's eye, here's how I would actually use it. Well, that may make them pick up that product and, and, and actually buy it. Continuing on, interactivity. Again, you can, if you can't physically get to a store, um, this allows you the ability to, to see something and maybe 360 degree view it. Um, again, maybe watch videos of how other people are, are using the product. Greater information density. When we look at a package for maybe your magic phone or so on uh, in the Apple store, there's limited information on the box, right? We can't tell that much about it. So I have some fancy Clorox wipes here that I've probably scalped from somebody. There is limited information on the box about what this product can do. But if I can go on the internet to the cloroxwipes.com, I'm not sure if that's a real website, and learn more information about it, get infinitely more information that can ever be printed on this container, that is much more information dense, information rich um, than anything. Can give some more information about its pricing um, for sure. At the same time, something that's a problem is it enables price discrimination. If you've never gone to Google Amazon price discrimination, then you've probably never truly lived. If you sign out of your Amazon accounts and cleared out all your browser cache and everything else, and you looked for some products and then called a friend in some other place and had them search for the same product, Amazon has been accused before of understanding who you are, what information they've gathered about you, what type of device you're connecting to the Amazon store through via, and whatever information it can collect about you as a person and offering you one price for some particular product. And then for that exact same product, offering it at a different higher or lower price to somebody else based on the information they've collected about that person. And there's a few examples of people connecting to the Amazon store on an iPhone versus an Android and getting offered two different prices to purchase a product based on how they've collected. Uh, the, on the data that they've collected on that person. So there's quite a few videos and some stories on the interwebs about price discrimination from Amazon based on the data they've collected about you, um, insinuating that folks that have iPhones or use Macs to connect to their store um, will pay a higher price for products than folks that aren't. Um, so it enables price discrimination um, and it can enable it for sure. It's a little bit different because it allows us to personalize or customize, customize some of the messaging or goods. You know, when you go to a brick and mortar store, it can be a little bit more difficult to get something designed or experience designed specifically for you. But just as though Amazon allegedly um, was involved in price discrimination, we can take information we know about you as a customer through our customer intimacy uh, data gathering and offer you a different experience in the online store, a different portal, product um, customization or differentiation based on what we know about you. And we can also use our social technology. <laughs> We've chatted before about this. How many times have you been mentioning um, verbally with some of your friends, boy, I really would like to have X, Y, or Z. And then you open up Instagram and there all of a sudden are a bunch of ads for that product on, on Instagram. And you are like, I know they're freaking listening to me. This has to be real. They have to hear me. Um, my example recently is uh, a purple mattress. I have wanted to look at a purple mattress. I wanted to get a purple mattress. And I said the words to my friend, I want to look at a purple mattress. And I opened Instagram and they were all freaking ads for purple mattresses. It is not a coincidence, I swear. I did not search for purple mattress on my phone. 
there's nothing else I did than say purple mattress. And all of a sudden, that's where all my ads were. Erica. Yeah, I forgot to mention in class, actually, the day after you mentioned purple mattresses, I went on my Snapchat and got ads for purple mattresses. It was really freaky. So now that we've said it all and your phones are hearing it, sorry, go into Instagram, go into Snapchat and let me know if you're getting anything about a purple mattress. I'm sorry. Um, let's, let's up it a little bit. Let's say some good stuff. Tesla, new iPhones. I'm not gonna say Android because that's a dirty word around here. This is an Apple household. Um, it's, it's really interesting. And to a point, those apps are collecting sound data. Um, the story goes that it's all happenstance and I still refuse to believe it, but that's kind of funny, Eric. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm sorry, did you get one? I think you might be on mute. I got one, it's pretty quality mattress, I'm just saying. Um, but then we can use that social technology to push advertisements to try to entice you. We can use the network effect by saying so many of your other friends have also made this particular purchase or gone to this particular store. Maybe you would too. And that's the power of some of that data that we've, we've gathered on, on so many of our customers. So some of the key concepts, some of the things that we just need to think about, um, they've, of course, the internet has just changed the way the companies have done business to a point now, if you don't have some internet presence, it's really very difficult for you to stay competitive. Business asymmetry is reduced. What does that mean? Uh, that means that, you know, you have all of your business online or all of your business uh, on premise in a, in a brick and mortar store. That has kind of been reduced for a little bit where most of our companies today find that they have either equal products on both platforms. Um, and there are some that have even more on the internet because it's easier to store things in a warehouse than it is um, in the store. If you look at Target, Target may have so many different SKUs, stock, stock keeping units um, in their actual physical stores. But then when you go to target.com, it's essentially limitless. Um, there are menu costs, search transactions costs are reduced. It's the more you're using um, the platforms, the cheaper it gets essentially. Dynamic pricing is enabled. The more that you buy a particular item, we're able to charge less per particular per unit for that as well. There can be switching costs um, associated with either certain, I'll say certain products, um, certain platforms. Once you're locked into a particular selling platform or point of sale system, it can be very difficult for people to switch to another one. Um, if you're using Facebook Marketplace as your selling platform, it can be very difficult for you to go to a different online platform such as Lightspeed. Um, that, can be, that can be different. You have to rebuild your entire online inventory and people might just say, I'll stick with the platform that I'm using, whether or not I'm happy with it or whether or not it charges more money, it might be worth it rather than having to rebuild my entire online presence. Of course, the problem is delayed gratification. Um, I can't believe waiting two days for something that I've ordered on Amazon, I'm willing to put up with. Like, oh, I two days is eternity. I can go to Target or wherever and get some of the things that I want right away. But I mean, they're talking about one day delivery and I'm, I'm pretty interested because I need that stupid random thing that I purchased now. Um, but, you know, who knows if that will come even faster. So any thoughts on some of the e-commerce stuff that we have here? Is two day okay for us or do we need faster prime delivery than two days? No, it's definitely pretty, pretty darn impressive that <laughs> that just became a thing and now a norm. Yeah, I'm okay with two days. So to set us up for something a little later, have you bought groceries this way? Who has? Michael's saying I've yes. Delivered, I know a lot of people. Um, How did it go? For the for the people that I know that have done it, I, I don't have done it myself, but you know, sort of almost like an addiction thing. Once they do it once, that sort of just consistent with it, and they're like, oh, just have to get these certain things this way, and then only get the specific things from the store. I ordered the, I did the online purchasing from Giant Eagle um, once before. And I put in that I wanted 
like a three pack of chicken breast and, you know, allow them to do substitutes and that's fine. And it came here and I opened it up and it was chicken thighs. And I about lost my mind. You cannot, you cannot substitute those. Those are not, those are not substitutable items. They're not the same thing. And I never did it again. And it was a one-time thing. And I probably just don't have to order chicken that way. And that's okay. Um, I can't say that that's the worst make or break experience with it. But I mean, there's constantly an Amazon cart item thing ready for me. Amazon came here yesterday and dropped off goodies so that I could build a little terrarium of plants that I'm just going to kill anyway. Has it enabled us to become a culture of buying things that we don't need because it's convenient? Probably. Before, when I would have to make myself go to the store, it's things I absolutely needed. They, I couldn't get by without them. And now it's probably like, oh, this is fun. This is cute. This is on sale. This is something I need. So it's interesting that it's pro the way that it's probably changed our buying habits to be more ad hoc or more random than it is true things that we might absolutely need. Um, I have friends that they have multiple Amazon packages on their doorstep every day. And it's always kind of interesting. So the last term that I had on there was disintermediation. And before I just tried to explain what it was without a picture, I wanted to share a picture at the same time. One of the true benefits of using business to consumer or in, and via the internet in particular is essentially here what we've all heard as taking out the middleman. The middleman that we're most used to is at least the retailer. But before it gets to the retailer, it also hits a distributor. So whatever it is that we're buying, let's say in this instance, it's clothing. Um, who's ever making the clothing? I'm a big shopper of Kohl's. I love me some Kohl's. My taste in clothes and amount I'm willing to spend is about the same price that Kohl's offers. And if I have Kohl's cash, all the better. I'm not willing to spend much more than that. I don't need the Nikes, it's okay. Whoever the manufacturer is, sends it to a distributor who will distribute all the sweaters they've made to all the different retailers they're in partnership with. It goes to the retailer, it goes to the customer. At each of those different junctions, everybody takes a little slice of money so that the manufacturer, distributor, and retailer can get an appropriate amount of income so that they can see a little bit of profit the cost to the consumer has to be high enough so that everybody can get a little slice of the pie and the manufacturer still covers the cost. If we can take out all of those middle steps, the distributor or the retailer, and perhaps go from the manufacturer straight to the customer, look at some of those savings potential to the customer. Maybe all along the manufacturer needed to make $20.45 for the sweater, no matter what. But the distributor wanted a little slice, the retailer wanted a little slice, and all of a sudden that cost of the sweater more than doubled. If we can buy things directly from the manufacturer to the customer, we have a huge potential for savings. I like to think of this again in the terms of buying a car. Um, I am a, a, a big Tesla fan, it's thing. When we buy cars, um, the car comes from the manufacturer, I believe, straight to the retailer in normal markets, and they're taking a slice of that, and now our car costs $40,000. We're going we're gonna to put it as cars in $40,000. But what if we can sell directly from the manufacturer to the customer? Can, our car, can the same car cost $20,000? It's a real possibility. We don't know how much of a slice that retailer is taking. Obviously, the Teslas aren't costing $20,000, but let's be realistic in terms of as you add more middlemen or intermediaries to the cost of these cars, to the cost of anything, the price is going to keep going up. One of the benefits of the internet has been the, able, the ability to go direct from the consumer, the manufacturer to the consumer and ultimately cost savings. So let's talk about now about digital goods goods that can be delivered over a digital network. Some of these can be pieces of software, they can be games. So if any of you are playing in maybe the Steam network, who plays Steam? I've only graduated as far as Stardew Valley in Steam. That's my game. Has anybody, who has not heard of Stardew Valley? 
Joseph's laughing at me. Stardew Valley is the best game that ever lived. Um, and that's about as good as my, my gaming experience. Um, in digital goods, the interesting thing about digital goods is the price of producing the first unit is typically the cost of the entire product. After we make one and we sell it, um, we can continue to charge the nearly the same amount and keep making more money for, for, for many of the products that we're making. The delivery cost over the internet is very low. We're not trying to ship cars across the country. We're not trying to ship boxes and pallets of clothing or other finished goods. We're just shipping digital current di digital items across the internet. Uh, marketing costs remain the same and the pricing is pretty variable depending really on what, what type of medium we're trying to, to market our product. But here we have the industry of digital goods are going through huge, huge changes right now. We saw it not that long ago, um, surprisingly not that long ago with music. And this is uh, through iTunes, right? Where you'd have to buy the entire album uh, just to get one song. And now we're seeing it with books, right? So we don't have to buy the entire book. We can download the, um, the book digitally. Uh, I saw a hand go up. Joseph. Yeah, just to branch off the um, Steam thing, um, they also do like sell physical stuff as well. Like, and they like since they're such a digital retailer, it was um, they actually had a lot of shipment issues adjusting to like physical stuff. Like, I don't know if you can see it, but I have one of those headset things, and shipping times on those was like. People were saying like six months when they first started shipping. So it's. Oh, wow. Yeah. But now it just collects dust. Yeah. They, um, I, I think it's been interesting. There have been, um, you know, I think to a point you could rent games as well through different, through, I'm not sure if Steam, you know, allows you to rent games, but it's interesting the different ways that we've come to monetize something and then re-monetize it. You know, it doesn't have to be licensed for a one-time use. You can keep it uh, over and over again. So I mentioned earlier B2C or business to consumer. And the example here is kind of Barnes and Noble. Um, and that's where the company is selling direct to consumer. Then we have business to business. And I have one here, this, this Chem Connect, where you know, Dow Chemicals is another one, if you've heard of that, DuPont is another one, where they're really only selling their commercial product to other commercials. And then we have consumer to consumer, and this is eBay, um, where one person is selling whatever products they had around the house or they made themselves. Um, Etsy would be another consumer to consumer, one that we're, that we're familiar with. Um, and then now a little newer one here is mobile commerce, m-commerce, um, and this is selling things uh, across this platform. I want to put in this category the things like let go, um, where they had all the outrageous commercials where you're selling like a bowling ball and whatever random stuff around the house. I'm going to lump things like let go into the mobile commerce kind of platform to give you some kind of an example of, of what might better go in there. Some of the models that we've seen here before, um, going into some kind of a portal to purchase your good. And I know Steam does a lot along the lines of the portal. Some other portals that we might be familiar with. Um, to a point, um, you typically log into Amazon, but I think, I don't know if you can do any purchases as a guest from there as well, but that's typically logging into a portal and it does give you some information about things that you've purchased in the past, uh, your own history as well, which, um, I, because you have to log in there, I want to call it more of a portal. An e-tailer or an electronic retailer, let's go target.com. Content providers, um, you know, if you're using uh, the paid version of YouTube, perhaps, um, if you're going into HBO, uh, what's it, HBO Go, if you're doing Paramount Plus, Disney Plus, those kinds of things. There's transaction brokers that are happening behind the scenes that are um, allowing the payment platforms to go through. There's market creators. These are the entire platforms that are allowing this to be hosted. Let's, let's call it YouTube. Um, service providers, 
and we can we can put Facebook Marketplace in there, um, and probably also put in Facebook Marketplace as the community provider as well. They're the ones setting this up, but it could also be eBay as the community provider um, to a point Craigslist and anything else that you may sell uh, consumer to consumer on Craigslist can certainly be that community provider as well. Um, I'm not sure that they're necessarily a service, but um, they're at least building that community where people can go do that selling. The revenue models obviously coming in for advertising. There is advertising on every single thing that you do. Um, they take a cut of the sales when you sell something on, on um, uh, Facebook, when you sell something on um, eBay, they all take a cut of that. There are subscription services as well. You may subscribe to be a part of that network to get access to whatever things that are being released. There's free software or freemium. So it may be free to download a piece of software or a game perhaps, but then to unlock certain features or to unlock other pieces or other levels or uh, additional gameplay, you may pay a little fee. Small transaction fees, every time somebody pays for something, they may take a, a small 1% fee, half a percent fee. And then affiliates. Um, I've seen this happen a bunch when you watch YouTube videos. If they're talking about a product that they use, you click on a link at the bottom and it sends you into Amazon perhaps, but they also get a small cut that, that YouTube creator, that content creator may get a small cut of that fee from you purchasing uh, that particular item because they recommended you to go over to that platform. Keep going past my slides. Um, this is just some quick visitor tracking here. And this is kind of rudimentary. And Rudy has joined the show. This is Rudy. He's, he's going to help. This is my little shadow. And he was patiently off to the side waiting for I don't know what. But this is Rudy. This is the Rudester. Um, this website visitor tracking, uh, this is from the book. But this is really very rudimentary. Most. And I'll say the lion's share of visitor tracking or any kind of tracking going on on our websites is happening through Google Analytics. If you've not paid attention, taken a look at anything, yes, hello, with anything with Google Analytics, um, just go out to google.com, put in Google Analytics. You can even go to uh, YouTube, which is Google again, um, and take a look at uh, Google Analytics and what they're doing with. Um, website tracking um, and inside of there, they're tracking how somebody moves through, a, how somebody moves through a website or somebody moves through a store, the clicks, the route they take. Um, there is a fascinating amount of information around, uh, around um, Google Analytics and what they can do. There's entire courses and certificates that people earn around Google Analytics. It's really very fascinating. Google's um, advertising network that they have, um, Google AdWords, follows sort of the same kind of model um, using cookies and some other advertising information on how they track how many people click on ads or how many times they um, expose an ad to people. Um, this is just a quick visual of, of what it's doing. And, how many times they may broadcast an ad out. The double click net is something that still exists out there. It's still used, but Google's AdWords is by far one of the largest advertising platforms that's in use. <clears throat> so social e-commerce, social network marketing, if you've used any of the Facebook platforms to promote an event, and I'm gonna stick mostly with um, Facebook on this one. If you've ever used um, Facebook's platform to to push um, an event or something along that lines, this may be pretty, pretty familiar to you. So the social algorithms in Facebook, you go in and you're able to promote an event um, that you may be having for a fundraiser, for your company, promote your company's website, your brand, whatever it is that you may be looking for. Um, and it's really very interesting. It can appear on people's uh, timelines, their news feeds. Um, whenever they log on to it, it can have a splash screen. Um, it can link to an online store if you want people to go in. That online store can actually sell merchandise or it could allow people to do donations, could allow people to sign up for an event. 
Um, you have a tremendous amount of insights into the type of uh, people that the ad is exposed to. Um, you can have it look at, uh, have the ad exposed to certain age groups, certain genders, certain um, social characteristics of the people. Um, really interesting segmentation of the entire marketplace Google is able, I'm sorry, Facebook is able to um, have your ad displayed to. It's actually kind of creepy the way that they have, the, the ability they have to segment your ad to, to so many different things. It's, it's a little unnerving. Um, and it is, you have the ability to say, you know, I have $100 I want to spend on this advertising campaign. Um, each click is going to be worth a penny or five cents or something like that is what they'll tell you. And um, you may spend my up to $10 of my $100 per day. Um, you could say I have $1,000 and I want you to spend up to $100 of my budget or $500 of my budget per day. And it will blast the daylights out of people with whatever your ad is and continue to come up on their, their timelines and their feeds. Um, it's really a powerful marketing medium that can expose your ad, your company, your sale, um, your nonprofit, your fundraiser, whatever it is to, to a lot of different people. It's, it's a really very powerful platform. Um, you could tie it to the like button, the huge audience in there. Again, you could tie it to shopping. Uh, people, can, people can share it around. Um, they can comment on it. And you can also do some crowdsourcing from it, uh, fundraising from it. You can um, have people donate to your site, whatever it is that you need to do. There is a tremendous amount of power behind particularly Facebook's um, marketplace and their, uh, their advertising. Huge, huge power behind this one. How has this, how has e-commerce affected B2B transactions? In 2015, in 2015 alone, B2B transactions um, for just the US, 6.2 trillion. Global market, 14.6 trillion. This is business to business transactions. Of course, the internet and networking are automating all the procurement. And we'll talk about some of that procurement just in the next few pieces here. So how do business to business procurement systems work? One of the more contemporary modern ways is through something called EDI or the electronic data interchange. Instead of a company calling a supplier, instead of Target calling Nabisco and saying, hey, we need a whole bunch of more cookies where the Keeblers, we need you to make some, some cookies for us. Um, and having someone make a phone call and say, I need like a thousand pallets of cookies now. Target's inventory system can connect to Keebler. And that's actually a bad example because Nabisco actually does manual merchandising in all the stores. Say Target's out of pillows. Target can go to the pillow manufacturer manually and call all the pillows and say, we need, we need lots more pillows. Instead, Target's inventory system automatically links to the pillow manufacturers. And once it hits inventory levels that are a low threshold, through an electronic data interchange, just an electronic order, can place an order for a particular store, particular warehouse, particular region to bring it back up to its set inventory level. And that happens through EDI. EDI is not specific just to retail. I work in healthcare. We use EDI um, to transmit patient bills and claims from our offices to the insurance carriers. Uh, we use it to transmit to Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, we use EDI to transmit every piece of data we can where there used to be paper trails. We also have private networks. Um, we may have a VPN, a virtual private network between sites that we can, um, between ourselves and other, other vendors that we can exchange data. We could do file transfers. There's network marketplaces where we can say, hey, we need a certain number of computers and find the vendor. Vendors will bid back to us and say, we'll provide what you're looking for at this price. And, and they, can, they can go against each other and, and, and help us with um, better, better prices. We can go to exchanges and say, you know what, here's what we're looking for and work with different vendors that are all participating in that same space and choose one that is the right kind of, um, the right kind of fit for us. 
And this is really all enabled by an internet backbone. We can go into portals, we can go into message boards, uh, we use the EDI and we have virtual private networks between ourselves and other vendors or portals as well and, and get all of the things that we need for our, to run our business. A little bit more on the EDI. Um, I, it, depending on what industry you go in or in what function you're working, I, you'll probably come across EDI at some level. Um, it's definitely used in just about every industry that I've ever come across. And again, it's that computer to computer exchange, whatever the transaction is, a purchase, an inventory, um, uh, invoices, uh, all happening electronically, where once it was a paper process, typically it happens over EDI. Every major industry is using it. There is some standard data structure that we're all using. Just a quick graphic explaining it. So some new ways of buying and selling over B, B2B. Um, these, we, I just mentioned every one of these a little bit ago. This is just a little bit um, more information about them. The in industrial networks, uh, private exchanges, and this could be for, okay, we're, we're a hospital system, we're looking for gowns or we're looking for medical equipment and it's linked to just exactly what we're specifically looking for. Or we have um, the ability to go to places like CDW uh, which will supply um, uh, equipment, uh, computer equipment and software um, just for perhaps large firms um, or uh, larger businesses. And depending on how many we're buying, get different prices for different uh, quantities of things. We can go to a hub and that's where Dell and Lenovo and HP may all be putting in their laptops uh, for us to buy at specific prices. Um, and then there's uh, the exchanges as well, where we can go in and say, we just need this many, this many of whatever. And um, Dell may come in and say, we have a pallet of laptops that a customer refused. You can come in and buy it at this price. And we may decide that's how we're going to buy it. It might not have been the exact same thing we were looking for, uh, but it might be close and it might be a good price and we might go with it. Just a graphic from the book for, for some of these things here. So what's the role of M-commerce in business? And M-commerce, again, going to the, the mobile commerce. So this is one of the fastest growing pieces. Uh, in 2017, 37% of all e-commerce happened, happened in a mobile platform. Um, some areas, it can be up to 50%. We're familiar with a lot of this. I mentioned it earlier. Amazon, of course, eBay is happening a lot more on a mobile phone than it did um, particularly on a computer. Sales of digital content, music, our iTunes, TV, whatever you're watching on TV, and in-app sales. If you're playing a game on a mobile device, a uh, smartphone, or a tablet, you're doing an in-app purchase for a game, a new level, or some of that um, to, to unlock additional pieces to the game, those all count in that mobile platform, that m-commerce marketplace. Location-based services and applications. So used by 74% of smartphone earners, owners. Who is playing the little Nintendo thing where you had to like, it wasn't Nintendo, it had the little ball, Pokemons, the Pokemons? Makes the sound. Pokemon Go, sound familiar? Location-based services, application based on your GPS service, Geo social, find where your friends are. There could be advertising, take you to different places. And um, while that was more gamified, there's other places where you could do. If you're looking for a home and you might go into a place like Zillow, uses the information about where you are, tracks houses that are for sale and brings it up in real time, what particular you're doing. And then it links you to sellers that are um, uh, or agents that are helping you um, sell that particular house that you may be walking past and helps you link them together as well. So, uh, and this is a mobile, uh, obviously a mobile phone uh, platform. Um, Zillow is, I'm definitely, whether or not I think I'm even looking for a home at any time, it's just fun to go into Zillow and look at the outrageous things that they're charging for homes or the outrageous ways that people have decorated their homes, I think is also kind of funny. So I mentioned earlier um, about shopping at Giant Eagle or using the online, um, 
methods for buying groceries. And I, some of us have probably heard of or used Instacart. So do we think that this platform, Instacart, is kind of here to stay? Is this a little bit more COVID related and it might go away? Um, if you've used it, what did you think? Um, are, are we hooked on Instacart? I haven't used it, but a friend of mine uses it a lot because she doesn't have a vehicle. So mm -hmm. really, it's very convenient for her to get groceries sometimes and not have to get an Uber and then a Lyft back, you know, because she's going to pay either way. So it, it, yeah. it saves her, her money to just pay for the delivery instead of paying for the ride there and back. And then also, I've, I've been doing some little driving they have there's a another app out here called GoPuff and it's kind of okay. like the same thing except Instacart they actually go shopping for you but GoPuff already has all the inventory in a warehouse and then they just you know and they're selling everything alcohol cigarettes food it, it's just all different options people have and I, I think a lot of people are utilizing it more and more because they're like growing adding new locations, new warehouses. That's a cool one. I've never heard of that one. So I see some Instacart and DoorDash have become normalized due to COVID and I feel like they're here to stay. Um, I think it's super helpful. You know, people can't get out of the house or they can get out of the house uh, when COVID settles. I'll be more interested to see how it is when they get out, but when COVID settles down, it's convenient service for families who have busy schedules for sure. Um, Someone works for Instacart and use it sometimes as well. Some folks think it will um, it will die down. Um, you know, I think it'll be interesting. I have not used the it. I um, someone loves GoPuff. I, I I'm interested in the home delivery of alcohol. That seems really interesting. I would like that. Um, I I still haven't even used DoorDash. I think I feel behind the times with that, but I still just haven't even tried DoorDash, and I I don't know why. I just haven't. Rudy is very helpful. He's just sitting right here. I think he might want some DoorDash and his wife. But I I don't know why I haven't gotten into using any of them. I don't know why. Um, DoorDash is great, but I find myself spending twice the amount of I would if I just went to the restaurant. Um, sometimes shop for Instacart users and it's definitely died down a lot. So if you've, you've worked for them, and you find that the amount of stuff that you're doing is, is going down a little bit. That's interesting. Yeah, I've uh, I've not used Instacart. I think I just used the online shoppers that were, and it can be expensive if you actually tip right. I think you should be tipping appropriately. Absolutely. And if someone's delivering to your house, you got to tip them as well. Um, so just kind of moving on from that and other mobile platforms, I think we're all using these to some point, right? You know, we're all going into our bank accounts on our website or credit cards, anything else. Um, every time we do anything, we're opening up something and we're getting a bajillion ads for no matter what we do. And 55% of our online retailers have some kind of an e-commerce website. There's a Target app. There is um, a Barnes and Noble app. There's a Dick Sporting Goods app. There's every kind of app. I like the Dick Sporting Goods app for shoes. Because when you go into Dick's, like you can never find anybody to help you and choose ever, ever. But you can go in there and go into inventory of the store and like scan the shoes of your size. And I think that's more helpful. And then that way you don't have to find somebody to tell them, to, for them to tell you they don't have it in your size. You could just not have it in your size and move on with the rest of your life and not have to bother anybody. So, you know, what issues do we have to address when you're building an e-commerce presence? You know, just like when you're starting to build a data warehouse or before you get into build a data warehouse, what is the end goal? What are the objectives that you're trying to achieve? You know, my company often comes to me and says, you know, our marketing person will say, we need an app. And I just kind of look at them and say, for what? And that's not being facetious. I'm not being a jerk. Um, tell me what the objective of having an app is and we'll get on board. And all I hear is, kind of a reproduction of the same thing that's on our website. That's not a reason to have an app. It should do something different. It should offer something different. It should have some other kind of navigation or business purpose or objective. 
but the purpose of having an app shouldn't necessarily be just to recreate what's on your website. So we don't have an app yet. Um, I just don't hear the business need for it. And choosing the right technology to achieve those things. You know, it, it, how should it function? What should it look like? What's the platform? Um, everything about it really needs to have a lot of thought built around it. Develop an e-commerce presence map, your websites, your email, your social media, and to a point, your, <clears throat> your offline media. And that's your print material, any marketing material you may have that is pamphlets, brochures, things like that. And develop your timeline. How long should this take to build, to launch, to wireframe, to think out, and then to actually launch this thing? And you should, of course, be mar par uh, partnering with some market experts to have some idea of um, what this actually should look like and not just kind of be taking a stab at this and then trying to get yourself or your company into development and, and not having a clear timeline. It could be rushed to market and not work well. It could take way too long and um, it costs way too much money. So you're gonna need some, some partners doing this to make sure that, that it's done correctly. And this is just a quick little presence map. This comes from the from the book here, talking about a website, what the platforms might be, and what you might do on an email, social media, and what you might do on it, and then your offline media and the things that you might do on it as well. And this can be kind of helpful if your company's, especially early on, or trying to adopt something new, and you're trying to just brainstorm the different things that might be available on it. And with that, we've come to the end of chapter 10.